Welcome class to the extra credit assignment 6.3 notes and basically what this is is another form of integration that you will not need for the AB calc test but that if you go on further in calculus you will need to know how to integrate using integration by parts and what it is is it's the product rule for integrals. but it's kind of like we're having to go in the reverse direction from the original product rule. So we have to start by remembering what the product rule for derivatives was. So we need to recall that if you took the derivative of a product of two functions, and in this scenario, u is one function of x and v is another function of x, and we're trying to take the derivative of their product, it was basically u prime v plus v prime u. That was product rule for derivatives. And so you could think of that as du dx, derivative of u with respect to x times v, plus the derivative of v with respect to x times u. So that was our product rule for function, or excuse me, for derivatives. And so now what I'm gonna do is just kind of solve that really quickly for, um, for dv dx u. So like if I subtracted this term to the other side, I would have this. I'd have d dx times the product of two functions minus du dx v is equal to dv dx u. And so this is leading toward the integration by parts formula, but it all stems from product rule for derivatives. So product rule for derivatives is you take the derivative of the first function times the second plus the derivative of the second function times the first. And now I'm just kind of rewriting it this way. And then to better lead toward the formula, I'm going to swap the equal sign here. So I'm going to say that dv dx u is equal to the derivative of the product minus du dx v. Okay, now I'm going to introduce the integral. I'm going to go ahead and integrate both sides. And I'm going to integrate everything with respect to x. Integrate this with respect to x, integrate this with respect to x, and integrate this with respect to x. So that's what the dx means when it's inside the integral, is you're integrating with respect to x. Okay, well on this left side, I'm integrating a derivative and a function. So it's a derivative times a function. So I can't really, I don't have a known formula for that antiderivative. So all I'm going to do basically is just cancel out the dx's. And I'm going to call this the integral of u dv. So the integral of this function u times dv. Now here, I can go ahead and cancel out the integral with the derivative because I have a derivative of this function here. And I'm taking the antiderivative of the derivative. So these will cancel. And I'll just end up with u, v. And then over here, I have kind of the same situation I had here, where I'm taking the integral of a derivative times another function. So it's not like the derivative of the whole thing. It's the derivative of u with respect to x and then times another function, v. So I don't have a known formula for that and it's not going to cancel so the only thing that does cancel are the dx's and I end up with minus the integral of v du and so right there is our integration by parts formula so you use this formula when you have a product of two functions inside the integral one of the functions is going to be called u, and it's going to be easy to find its derivative. The other function is going to be called dv, and it'll be easy to find its antiderivative. So again, this is the integral. You use this formula when you have the integral of the product of two functions. One of them will be easy to find the derivative of. So u is one of them. And then dv is the other one. 
And this will be the function where, where it's easy to find the antiderivative. So when you're using integration by parts, you want to keep your eye out for the u and for the dv, which is not always that easy. So we have this excellent little memory tool called Lipit. And this tool, it helps you decide which function to pick for you. It gives you like a good set of priorities. It like ranks them from um, best to worst for which function to pick for you. So the L stands for logarithm, logarithmic. I stands for inverse. P stands for polynomial. E stands for exponential. And T stands for trigonometric. So these help you decide which function to choose for you. And then the other function by default would be the dv. And it goes, and this is the order of best like best to least or best to worst. The best case if you have a combination of these functions is to choose the logarithm for you. If the logarithm is not there, then second best would be inverse. If that's not there, third best is polynomial. If that's not there, then you're stuck with exponential and or trig. These are the least, <laughs> um, you don't want to use either of these for you unless you absolutely have to because these derivatives they just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and, and you'll see that as we do some of these examples. So let's go ahead and begin with an easy one. So I've got number one right here is asking me to find the integral of this product. So first of all, I want you to notice that I have a product. x cosine x is equal to a product of two functions. Like if I was finding the derivative of this, I'd have to use product rule. Same as goes for the antiderivative, I have to use integration by parts, which is the product rule for integrals. Okay, so according to Lippitt, x is going to be my u because x is a polynomial function. So this one is a polynomial function, and cosine is the trig. So in terms of Lippitt, polynomial comes before trig, so I want to use the x as my u. So I'm going to let u be x. Okay, as soon as you find u, then you need to find du. And so du is going to be 1, because that's the derivative of x, and then dx. All right, now that I found u and du, that leaves dv must be cosine x. And since this is a derivative, I'm going to take the antiderivative. Oh, and actually, I forgot to include the cosine x dx. That's all part of dv. So I'm going to take the antiderivative of this, and that's just going to be uh, sine x. So v is equal to sine x. OK, so that's step one. So step one is you determine u and du, and then dv and v. So this is u and its derivative, and then dv and its antiderivative. Step two is to use the formula. And if you recall, the formula goes uv minus integral v du. So in this scenario, that would be x sine x minus the integral of minus the integral of v du. So that would be x sine x times, or minus the integral of sine x dx. So integral of u times v minus integral of v du. Okay, so then I have to find this antiderivative, but see now it's no longer a product. This is kind of the, the beauty of this process is when you take the derivative of a polynomial, eventually, as the, the degree of the polynomial decreases, eventu eventually you end up with a constant. So this is like 1 times sine. And so that's great. That's just a constant multiple rule instead of product rule. So I can easily find that antiderivative is negative cosine. And so then I have x sine x minus negative cosine x. And then remember, once you take the antiderivative, the dx goes away. And then I'll just simplify this a little bit. 
And then don't forget to add your constant because we always add the constant when we're taking antiderivative and we're done. This right here would be our final answer. So that's our first practice using integration by parts. The reason I call this an easy example is because it was done in two steps. Sometimes when you get to this part, the VDU, you have to use integration by parts again. So sometimes this becomes what we call an iterative process where you're sort of doing, you know, the same step over and over again. Um, but this one was nice and simple because the polynomial was a first degree. So it's first derivative turned into a constant. And so I didn't have to use integration by parts here. When you have something like number one, though, where the polynomial is a higher degree, then we use this process called tabular integration. It is one more thing to remember, but it is super awesome <laughs> because it will save you so much time in the long run. Now, you use this method when you have a polynomial multiplied with a sine or cosine, like in example one, or a polynomial with an exponential. Function. That's when you would use the tabular method. And so I'm actually going to show you how another way I could have solved example one using tabular integration. Basically, what you do is you set up a table. One column is u, and then the other column is dv. And then you would take your u, which in this case is x, and then your dv, which in this case was cosine x. And on the u column, you just keep finding derivatives until you end up with 0. So the derivative of x is 1, derivative of 1 is 0. So this column is only going to have three entries. And then for dv column, you take the antiderivative um, until you get to where the other side had a 0. So since this had three terms, I'm going to take the antiderivative twice. So the antiderivative of cosine is positive sine. The antiderivative of positive sine is negative cosine. So this side, you're taking the antiderivative and this side you're taking the derivative until it equals zero. Okay, once you have your column filled out, then you basically do this sort of um, cross thing. So you take the first term from u and go to the second term from dv, and that first is gonna have a positive one and then you go kind of you just keep going like that until you get to the last term from dv so this one's only going to have two parts to it and these signs are going to alternate plus minus plus minus plus minus and then you basically just multiply so i'd have x times positive sine so that's x sine x and then minus or like negative times that i guess you could say so it'd be um yeah i guess i'll just do plus negative 1 times negative cosine. And so then you end up with x sine x plus cosine x plus a constant. So if you notice, I end up with the exact same answer, which you should. It's just another method of doing the same problem. And my only work was this little column right here. So if you get really comfortable with this method, it is so wonderful when you have something like example one where it's a polynomial multiplied with sine or cosine or a polynomial multiplied with an exponential. Tabular method will save you so much time, especially if this were a higher degree. Because if this were a higher degree and I, and I went the long way, I'd have like maybe four or five or six steps. Whereas with tabular method, it would just be the table and then your answer. So let's look at a couple more examples and I'm going to use the tabular method. So in example two, I have a fourth degree polynomial, which if I were to do this the long way, that would require five steps or six steps using integration by parts. But if I use the tabular method, it's just a table and then the answer. So again, I start with my u column and then my dv column. 
my U column is going to be the polynomial because whenever you have polynomial and trig, you want to remember lipid. Polynomial comes before trig. So I'm going to use x to the fourth for du and then cosine x for dv. This column are the derivatives. So I have 4x to the third, 12x squared, 24x, 24, and 0. And you find all the derivatives until it goes down to 0. So you see the u has to be a polynomial, because polynomials are the only derivatives that eventually go down to 0. And the degrees go down by 1. 4, 3, 2, 1, degree, 0, and then no term at all. Now on this side, I'm doing antiderivatives, so never forget that. So the antiderivative of cosine is sine. Antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. Antiderivative of negative cosine is negative sine. Antiderivative of negative sine is cosine. And then antiderivative of cosine is sine. So you notice with the trig, they just go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. That's why they are ideal for the dv functions. OK, and then now I do my sort of every other term. And it, the signs alternate, so it's plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. And then basically, I'm just ready to do my answer. So my answer would be, I start with x to the fourth times positive sine x. So that's x to the fourth sine x. And then the next term, I have this double negative, because it's negative 1 times negative cosine. So that'd be plus 4x to the third cosine x. And then the next term is positive times a negative, so it's negative. So minus 12x squared sine x. And then the fourth term is going to be negative because it's negative times positive. So it's negative 24x cosine x. And then the last term is positive because it's positive times positive. So plus 24 sine x and then plus a constant. Sorry, I ran out of room. <laughs> so it's a very long answer that I didn't even have room to write. It would take, like, I'd have to go all the way from left to right to fit it. But it had one, two, three, four, five, six terms if you include the plus C. And never forget the plus C. So if I was not using tabular method, I would have to use integration by parts like five times to eventually get to this answer, because this would have been my first UV minus VDU, and then this would have become another UV minus VDU, and then another UV minus VDU, and then another UV minus VDU, and then it's just a long process. So tabular method saves us a lot of pain and heartache. OK, so um, then for example 3, I'm going to use the same method, because notice I have a polynomial times an exponential. So that's another ideal case for tabular. And then just keep in mind, this, this particular function is not an indefinite integral. It's a definite integral. It has upper and lower limits. So I'm not going to add plus c at the end. I'm actually going to evaluate this at the end from 0 to 3. OK, so um, let's begin. So my u is going to be the x. And my dv is going to be the e to the negative x. And again, that's just by lipid. Polynomial comes before exponential. Oops, sorry, over here. So polynomial comes before exponential. OK, so let's take the derivative of x, which is 1, and the derivative of 1, which is 0. So this is only going to have to have two more entries. So if I take the antiderivative of e to the negative x, think of this negative as negative 1. And so that's like my k. And so I'm going to use this formula, where it's e to the kx. Antiderivative of e to the kx is e to the kx divided by k. So that means I'm going to have e to the negative x divided by negative 1. That's just negative e to the negative x. And then again, I'm going to take the antiderivative of that with respect to x. So I have negative e to the negative x divided by negative 1, which is just positive e to the negative x. And I will do my alternating, plus, minus. So then the answer would be x times positive 1 times negative e to the x. So it's going to be negative x e to the negative x. And then minus 1 times e to the negative x. So there's my antiderivative. And now I'm evaluating that from 0 to 3. So then I basically plug in 3. So I have negative 3 e to the negative 3 minus e to the negative 3 minus 0 e to the negative 0 minus e to the negative 0. So this becomes negative 3 over e to the third 
minus 1 over e to the third, which is um, negative 4 over e to the third. And then minus, so it's that, minus, this is just 0, minus 1 over e to the 0, which is 1. So it's, so the final answer is, let me move up here, the final answer is negative 4 over e to the third plus 1. And since we don't have a calculator, it's non-calculator, we just leave our answer like that. And there's no plus c, because this is not an antiderivative, this is an actual number. This is a definite integral, where the answer is actually a number, not an antiderivative. Okay, so these next two examples are a little trickier, so we're going to come back and visit those in video number two.